Now, it is difficult to make generalizations about society and social structure in Southeast Asia because of the great variety of states, of races, and its ethnic diversity. The two geographic portions of the area, the mainland and the archipelagos, or island chains, reveal contrasting origins. The mainland contains people who are descended from speakers of the Sino-Tibetan or the Sino-Tibetan language group, while the island peoples speak Austronesian languages with Chinese and Indian admixtures. Archaeology reveals Neolithic origins dating to the 5th millennium BCE. And the textbook shares that Imperial China and India influenced the region in many different spheres. So while China's influence was founded on military and diplomatic supremacy, India's stamp was trade, culture, and philosophy. And the dividing line between Chinese and Indian impact was central Vietnam. Now what is found in common in most of the states were the hereditary aristocrats who held political and economic power. And these urban-centered elites garnered the loyalties of various sectors of society, merchants, artisans, rice farmers, subsistence farmers, and the poor. And while women did not hold high rank, they did have more rights than their counterparts in China and India. So <clears throat> the first mainland centers of trade are known as Funan and Champa. Now Funan was the first large Southeast Asian civilization. It was centered on the lower Mekong Delta in present-day Cambodia and Vietnam and stretched into Thailand and possibly Malaysia. Funan lasted from AD the 1st century to 7th century. Funan is a Chinese name and it may be a transliteration of the ancient Kumar word meaning or word Banam meaning mountain. Funan, the earliest of the Indianized states in Southeast Asia, generally is considered by Cambodians to have been the first Khmer, Khmer kingdom in the area. And as a historian of the Asian society writes, the Funan culture flourished in the Mekong River Delta in southern Vietnam and was a center of Southeast Asian trade between the 1st and 5th centuries. This period saw an increase in international trade from the Mediterranean to China. Westerners sought the gold of the East and with the development of more advanced sailing ships that harnessed the power of the monsoon winds, transoceanic travel became possible. Now, few details are known about the Funan people. However, it is evident that they were a technically advanced seafaring people with the means to participate in trade on a large scale. Uh, one, a third century source, describes their ships as 200 feet long and able to carry 700 men and an extensive cargo. Studies on the Funan reveal that during the first century AD, when Rome ruled the Mediterranean, the Funanese traded widely, establishing a wonderful tradition of Hindu-influenced art and architecture and became skilled goldsmiths and jewelers. They also built an irrigation system that was impressive by today's standards and used an extensive network of canals for both transportation and agriculture. Funan was essentially an Indian civilization set in Southeast Asia. It was ruled by Hindu rulers and influenced by the culture of the Indian Payava kingdom. It absorbed Indian concepts of jurisprudence, astronomy, literature, and universal kingship. The Sanskrit language was used in Funan courts. It gave birth to the first writing system and inscriptions used in Southeast Asia. The area was a natural region for the development of an economy based on fishing and rice cultivation. And there is considerable evidence that the Funanese economy depended on rice surpluses produced by an extensive inland irrigation system. Maritime trade also played an extremely important role in the development of the Funan. But in the 6th and 7th centuries, the Funan was weakened by civil wars and it was absorbed by the pre pre-Khmer civilization of Chenla. Meanwhile, historical studies reveal the Hindu kingdom of Champa emerging around present-day Da Nang in the late AD 2nd century. Like Funan, it adopted Sanskrit as a sacred language and borrowed heavily from Indian art and culture. And by the 8th century, Champa had expanded southward to include what is now Nan Trang and Phan Rang. 
For centuries, the people developed <clears throat> a reputation as a race of warriors and pirates, defending their vast and prosperous lands from numerous invasions. However, in 1471, the empire finally collapsed before Vietnamese invaders. Only the grandiose temples and sanctuaries, irrigation systems, sculpture, woven cloth, and jewelry remain as evidence of this one great civilization. The Champa Empire flourished in central Vietnam for more than 1,000 years before it was defeated in the 15th century by northern Vietnamese. As Arab merchants stopped along the Vietnamese coast en route to China, Islam began to infiltrate the civilization and Hinduism soon became associated with the upper classes. So between the rise of the Khmer Empire around the year 800 and Vietnam's territorial push to the south, the Champa Kingdom began to diminish. Which brings us to present-day Cambodia, or the ancestors of present-day Cambodians. The Khmer conquered the Funan and politically dominated the region for several hundred years. Centering their government on the city of Angor, Angkor, Kampuchea became a magnificent mainland empire. It was the capital of a civilization which had achieved an enormous technical revolution in agriculture and irrigation, and on the basis of these developments, was able to construct a highly advanced culture. The Khmer, who now populate Cambodia, may have migrated from southeastern China to the Indochinese peninsula before the first century AD. They settled in the region before their present Vietnamese, Thai, and Lao neighbors. Now, according to historians, the ancestors of the early Khmer are believed to have arrived in the Angkor area between 5,000 and 10,000 years ago. They were attracted by the good fishing and plentiful water supplies offered by Ton Le Sap, which is an inundated freshwater lake and an attached river. The Khmer people were among the first in Southeast Asia to adopt religious ideas and political institutions from India and to establish centralized kingdoms encompassing large territories. Cambodia came into being, so legend has it, through the union of a princess and a foreigner. The foreigner was an Indian Brahmin named Kayundinya, and the princess was the daughter of a dragon king who ruled over a watery land. Despite its mythical beginnings, Cambodia's religious, royal, and written traditions stemmed from India and began to coalesce as a cultural unity in their own right between the 1st and 5th centuries. The first contacts between the people of Southeast Asia and the empires of India and China are believed to have taken place between 50 BC and AD 100. Chinese and Christian traders are believed to have arrived in Southeast Asia while searching for a maritime Silk Road route to replace overland routes blocked by horsemen tribes in Central Asia. Cambodian kingdoms owed much to Indian culture, which provided alphabets, art forms, architectural styles, religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, and a stratified class system. Local beliefs that stressed the importance of ancestral spirits coexisted with Indian religions, and they remain powerful today. The golden age of Khmer civilization, however, was the period from the 9th to the 13th century when the kingdom of Kambuja, which gave Kampuchea or Cambodia its name, ruled large territories from its capital in the region of Angkor in western Cambodia. While Kampuchea began as a Hindu monarchy, Hindu belief was replaced by Theravada Buddhism in the 12th and 13th century with its emphasis on equality of men and rejection of monarchic divinity. Jayavarman II, the most powerful of the kingdom of the most powerful ruler of the kingdom of Angkor, consolidated power and set up a capital at Angkor, Angkor Tom, naming his kingdom the Khmer, and crowning himself God King. Under Jayavarman VII, who ruled between 1181 and 1218 of the Common Era, Kampuchea reached its zenith of power and cultural creativity. And it was following his death that Kampuchea experienced gradual decline. And there are many factors that were involved in, in the decline. The important factors were the aggressiveness of neighboring peoples 
especially the Thai or Siamese. It was chronic political strife and the gradual deterioration of the complex irrigation system that had ensured rice surpluses. The Angkorian monarchy survived until 1431 when the Thai captured Angkor Thom and the Cambodian king fled to the south. Mm-hmm.